We are recording. We are back for another episode of Blazing Cards podcast, and this time we are joined by Patrick Hoban, which I'm very excited about. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, how are you doing, Patrick? Doing good. Good to talk to you, Austin. Yeah, I know. It's good to see you. We've been uh, longtime friends, and then we kind of lost touch once uh, I quit Yu-Gi-Oh!, and then you quit Yu-Gi-Oh!, and I think we just missed each other when I came back. You had already. Yeah, moved. yeah. <laughs> um, but you had all the success once. Once I once I quit, it seemed like you were the top player for years after that. So. <laughs> well, thanks. I appreciate. Yeah, it. you mind telling people uh, some of your accomplishments? Uh, yeah, sure. So I won uh, WCQ in 2013, uh, two ICSs and five, and five ARGs. Wow, crazy! How many tops <laughs> do you have? Do you, do you even keep counting? Or are you totally. Uh, yeah, something like 39, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. That is crazy. Uh, how, how'd you get into Yu-Gi-Oh? Um, I, w- I was a little kid, so I started playing when uh, Magic Ruler came out. So very, very early oh, on. You know, I went to the Books a Million with my friends, uh, and I was on the Pokemon at the time. And, and oh. <laughs> I never really played Pokemon or anything, but I just wanted the cards. Collected the cards. Uh, yeah. And then I, yeah, and I show up one Saturday, and my friends are like, "We're on the Yu-Gi-Oh now." <laughs> and I was like, "What's that?" <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's kind of where it started. <laughs> nice. And uh, so you didn't like watch the show or anything. Your friends just kind of pulled you in. Uh, I mean, I did watch the show as a kid, yeah, um, mm-hmm. but uh, my my friends definitely were, like, responsible for pulling me in. Yeah, so, right. My friend also hard. pulled me in. Mm-hmm. They uh, started the obsession, and then they, like, left after, like, I know. After, like, a month, and I was like, oh, well, now I'm just stuck with this new lifestyle. <laughs> and here we are now. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Still can't escape it. Uh, so you mind just telling people, like, your your journey to success and to the top, how, how you reached those heights? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I definitely spent a long time as uh, not <laughs> anywhere close uh, to, to winning anything. So I guess I started playing in like 2002, 2003, but I was a kid at the time, right? I was like nine or 10. Um, so I, I, I wasn't really doing anything for a while. I think I went to my first locals in probably 2005. Um, so like goat format um but i don't even i didn't even talk my first regional until like 2007 uh so just a long time of being a kid and you know I, but then i really started to get into online you know i think that was what like really started to, to get me going because i didn't live close to a card store or anything um so it was just like a good way because you know you know little kid my mom wasn't about to drive me an hour to <laughs> play the play what the card like, like ybd uh yeah ybd no images oh. actually uh the, for the first full year that i used ybd no images <laughs> wow that's crazy <laughs> um, i remember those days yeah and then i started to get into etc for a while it was like an old school forum okay um, and then on over to duelist grounds uh and, and yeah, I think Duelist Grounds is probably what really made me want to start playing competitive. Gotcha. Nice. Yeah. And so what was, so from, from regional, from your first regional top to winning YCSs and whatnot, how, how did you kind of make those uh, leaps? Yeah, sure. I mean, it was a, a long time of just losing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. When I played, I played until 2013 and you were obviously a great player. But you weren't like dominating to the point to where right after I left, it seemed like you were just topping and winning everything. Yeah, sure. Um, So I think that, uh, I mean, the main thing I started doing was like just building decks. I I think that that was like really the thing that uh, I think every single win I've ever had was never like I came in playing whatever everyone else was playing. And I think that I really started to do it around like the 2013 area, but I also kind of don't think it was like super possible before too much earlier than that, right? Because like the cards were almost just not good enough, right? Like but up until like a certain point in the game, it was like, you know, you summon one thing and then if they stop it, you're, you're setting your cards, you're passing it, there's someone one thing. Yeah. Um, but I guess there started to be a point where, you know, you can consistently, like the cards were good enough that you could start doing like multiple things a turn. I think that's like really when it opened up from like a deck building perspective mm-hmm. to make that kind of thing possible. Gotcha. So you were just like building better decks than everybody basically. And then if they like countered 
your first move or something, you always could have like a follow-up basically. Yeah, sure. And I mean, just like, you know, I, I, I always felt like the best decks were if I could play and do what I wanted to do and you could play and do what you wanted to do, like my deck should win. Like that's what I felt like a best deck kind of was. Um, you know, and, and really just like looking for different advantages. Like when I went nationals, I played Vanity's Emptiness in my Dragon Roller deck. Um, and that wasn't really a played card at the time, but it was great because I played something like 11 mirror matches. <laughs> I'm just like some Drago sack split Vanity's. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, things like that worked really well. Well, yeah, you were responsible because I remember that was a huge craze and they jumped from like a dollar to like eight dollar. <laughs> so that was you. What what decks did you pioneer or uh, what big tech cards did you pioneer as well? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, Dragon Rulers was my first win. I, I think the like most innovative things I did was most people were playing like one Sacred Sword. I think a couple people were like on to two at the time, uh, but I was just like, this card's great. I'm going to play three. And uh and the vanity's emptiness in the main deck, I, I kind of feel responsible for ruining <laughs> many formats because of that card uh, specifically. But then um, after that, uh, there was a mermail deck that I thought w was really good. It was like, I think every mermail deck up until that point had been really focused on like, let me just put my hand on the table and try and kill you in one turn. Mm -hmm. And I was doing more things like summoning Pike and discarding gun to get back like Turge to discard a marksman to add back the gun and then like make Bahamut sharks and like, you know, things like that that are much more like combo based, but um, still give you follow ups and things like that. So kind of like trying to shift away from like just a kill you mindset. Um, Burning Abyss was probably a big one. Um, I think I was really the first person to put other Burning Abyss in the decks. Uh, so like, um, you know, the Burning Abyss decks were kind of trap decks when they came out, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, people play tour guides and graphs and seers and like the good ones, but then like a pack later, they came out with more, less good ones, but they were still names. So like, you know, Rubik, I think people played a like one or two of those. Um, and then Alex, uh, and, uh, what's the other one? Alec and, uh. Cow cab. Yeah, that. Uh, where I was just like, these cards, it's not that they have the best effects, but it's they are just additional names. Mm -hmm. And so I think it like shifted the Burning Abyss deck away from being like a trap deck to just like, let me summon a couple Dantes every turn and then, <laughs> you know, <laughs> make it much more floaters and things like that. Um, uh, Shadal's, I think Shadal's was a cool one too, because I, I remember playing uh, Triple Super Poly. And that was like a really big advantage because everybody's just like super poly discards as a cost. So you can't get the Shadal effects. It's not that good. And I was like, you guys are crazy. This is the best card in the game. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, um, I think those are, those are some of the decks that I've been, that I had the most success with. There's a couple decks though, that I, I felt like were really good and I never got a win with though, like Sylvan's. Mm -hmm. That one was the one that got away almost, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it well, was it was just like bad luck, you think, that kind of? Uh, I don't know. So like I, I made it to top 16 of the, the WCQ that year. This is probably my saltiest loss ever, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but uh, I, I just ended up losing in time. Uh, and, and But that deck was so cool. It could literally search Vanity's Emptiness from your deck. Oh, wow. Uh, it, it, was, it was really cool. You could go, and it, it could do it very consistently, but essentially it would summon double Aurea uh, to, to make it so that you could look at the top eight cards of your deck and then do it twice. So you could look at the top 16 cards Thanks. and then with, uh, with, with uh, her, uh, the, the one that draws, um, you play triple emptiness. So like, you know, 16 cards, yeah. you just need one of the, one of a three of to be in there and you get to draw it. And so you can kind of like pick which cards you you get to draw there. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it could, it could essentially stir emptiness. <laughs> I thought that was a really cool interaction. Jeez. Okay. I, I guess I should have asked, were there any decks you didn't pioneer? Because it seems like you're on the <laughs> forefront of like all these cards, all these decks. What, what do you think made you, obviously you're, you're an incredibly intelligent guy. Uh, you've gone on to like make your own company and everything, but what do you think made you um, have such an advantage and like find all these tech cards or create all these decks? What, what do you think like kind of separated you from the rest of the players? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, 
definitely had a really good friend group uh, that, that are tested a lot with. Really though, like we just put in a lot of hours. Like we played a lot. Uh, you know, I I I spent so many hours just in my room by myself testing and see the different interactions. You know, mm. um, I also think we did a couple uh, like unique things when it came to play testing too. Like so, we almost entirely play tested with our hands face up on like so that both players were looking at both of the hands. And then rather than trying to like make winning the goal in play testing, we were trying to just like discuss and then just choose to not be biased. Like it, as if we didn't know what was there, even though we clearly did. Yeah. Um, but I mean, honestly, that that just started from like misplays. <laughs> and then like, wait, no, you're not supposed to do that. Let me see your hand. And then we just <laughs> kind of realized that it was a better way to do it in general. Um, you could learn a lot more from it. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. That's really smart. So basically you have like two players trying to make the optimal play and then, um, you know. For both of them, really. Play. Yeah. Yeah, and, that's awesome. And really, like, I think we'd try and test, you know, whatever decks we were playing against the meta, right? Like we weren't trying to always test like our my deck versus your deck kind of thing. Like we would actively try and build like everything and then we would try and build our own thing and then it would be our own thing versus you know all these other decks test. nice wow that's awesome so were you looking at like ocg uh decks to get any inspiration or like their formats or were you just kind of look reading the cards yourself and being like oh i can see how these might fit together not, not as much ocg um just because they don't have like as many tournaments over there at least not big tournaments right um, but didn't really look at OCG as much. I definitely looked at the tips page on Wikipedia a lot. Um, I, I honestly, that was one of the like big things is so, uh, like if you go in pretty much any cards, um, tips page on the Wikipedia, it'll tell you all the different interactions with like obscure cards you would just forget about. And yeah, oh. yeah, like, so I, I think you would kind of start with like, I'm trying to end with this kind of thing, right? Like, I know this is an inherently good combination. Like, what's the best thing I can do to that? Or how do I consistently like search a floodgate when I do this thing? And then you would think about, okay, well, if I'm trying to make Naturia Beast, then uh, what are all the level fours in the game, right? And what are all the level ones in the game? And then you would just kind of like go through and try and figure out which ones had the best interactions together. Um, and then kind of like back into, okay, now how do I make this happen consistently kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, I feel like you were responsible for the triple upstart phase or craze. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. that was, that was just to promote consistency, I assume. Yeah. I mean, the, just the, basically the premise is the, if I can have 37 cards in my deck and you have 40 in your deck, then I'll draw my better cards more often than you will. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. You know, because, like, at that point, like, why is 40 the best? Like, I, that's pretty much the sole reason for 40 to be the best. Um, I think there's a handful of exceptions where, like, you know, if it's super, super searchable, then I guess at that point you would care more about just having more options in your deck. Because, like, if every card is searchable, then you don't need to draw it as much. But as yeah. a rule, but, like, yeah, just in general, like, fewer cards in your deck, you're going to see your better cards more often. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that's something that could have been... Um kind of implemented into decks before you um had started it like you think that could have been um yeah sure viable uh, before i do and i mean like if there was ever a point where we were playing over 40 cards consistently like as a community maybe not but yeah. like if every format before that you know we were largely playing 40 cards you know some people play 41 or 42 or whatever but by and large you know everybody's playing 40 cards you know that's still kind of the reason they were doing it right so i, I think it actually could have been implemented a lot earlier because upstart came in i don't know, like 2003 or something yeah super i think it's magic ruler yeah um yeah <laughs> yeah so it's like been there since the beginning do you feel like there are any other cards that um people just like missed or underrated oh, totally yeah <laughs> <laughs> any any that come to mind uh um yeah i mean i always thought there were there were a couple that were just super powerful like Rivalry and Gozen always like struck me as like these are really really powerful cards. Um, Unicor, uh, like I, I know Necroz was like a whole format, but I think as a standalone card, Unicor was one of the best cards ever printed. Really? Um, so like there there are just some things like that that I think just you know sometimes they just have wider applications. And now 
Um, like I don't keep up with the game very much at all, but I have like a lot of friends that are still involved. And um, so, you know, I'm, I see when new cards come out every so often, and like now some of the cards are just so crazy that like, I'm sure it's still very much like cards going to the radar. A Brilliant Fusion was another card um, that like people weren't really playing. It kind of like slid under the radar when it came out. Um, and I was like, this card's amazing. <laughs> like, <laughs> you can't do normal summons. But, um, so yeah, that was, I don't know. I, I think it's pretty common. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sad to hear you don't uh, keep up with the game. I was hoping maybe you'd, you'd have a comeback <laughs> one day. But hey, I, no, I wouldn't rule it out though. I, I, I do really like playing and uh, I'd, I'd definitely be interested at some point. Really? All right, cool. That's that's good to hear. That's good to hear. I'm rooting for for like all my old friends to come back at some point. In yeah, time. right? <laughs> I think we all just have to get in the same room and agree to do it and then we'd all do it. <laughs> I know, right? Well, even like Dale says he might, you know, come back for like Toronto events or whatever. And oh, Dale's a legend. Back. I feel like he's been coming back from Toronto events forever now. Yeah, <laughs> right? <does> so, well. <laughs> so there's hope that everyone will, will slowly come back. Sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, so what would your advice be to somebody who like wants to get better at the game? and kind of get to where you were yeah sure um i mean definitely want to find a group of of people that not just play but i think want the same things as you right like if you have just a group of people to play with uh but you're the only person that's like trying to travel and go to events and like consistently win um you know that's that's harder i think so like you know you can definitely find people online like that that just want the same things so i think having like a core group of people is, is really important um but i'd also say like it depends what you want i would say don't focus on winning the actual event um to be honest i think that's kind of a trap uh really? like yeah just because like one thing that i saw so often is that people would really want to win an event right and they'd be very good players they'd be super consistent like consistently topping every single event of a format, you know, being like super close to getting that win. Um, and, you know, at some point they get it, right? Uh, but but then like kind of the problem is they got what they wanted. So they stop going. Uh, and I think that if you focus on like the consistency and like going for just, I want to top as many events as possible, you know, the wins just kind of come. Like for me, so uh, I, I really wanted to have the most tops. Right. Really? And that was like my, that was the thing I wanted the most. Right. Um, and so when I got my first win, I only had seven tops and Adam still had 23 at that point. So I was just like, in my mind, I was very far away from what I wanted. Um, but I feel like it's very easy to, if you decide you want to win an event and then you get there, it's very easy to stop at that point because you got what you wanted. So it's like a double edged sword. Gotcha. So really setting like a more long term goal kind of. Yeah, sure. To, to keep you on your game. That makes sense. So why did you end up getting out of the game? What made you decide to stop? Yeah, so I guess uh, I got out of it initially to go work on, uh, go work for the Democratic Party in the 2016 campaign. Okay. Um, and then I stopped playing for about six months while I was doing that. And I actually came back for probably three or four months after that. Uh, but then I, I, I quit and to, to focus on Parvenu. Yeah, perfect. Do you want to talk a little bit about, um, I, I mean, I really want to get into this, but there's still a couple more uh, Yu-Gi-Oh questions, but you just want to give a little bit of uh, background on your company real quick before. Yeah, sure. Um, so we, uh, we do two things. It's they're both to help nonprofits raise more for charity. So one is donations at, at checkout, you know, like grocery store, online. Um, and then the other one is uh, data for, for nonprofits to be able to go identify donors, go identify local businesses that they want to partner with. Um, new volunteers and then you know we can get their email addresses their contact information all that so yeah. that they can actually go reach out to them that's amazing i i, I want to dive more into that but um i want to switch i want to keep focusing on Yu-Gi-Oh and then kind of do yeah that. yeah sure. <laughs> um what do you think the game got more skillful as time went on so you were playing kind of in like the older formats and the newer formats how would you what do you think yeah, uh, so I definitely think it switched um, from like where the skill sets are. Mm -hmm. So I think that early on it was much more about technical play mm -hmm. as a skill set um, because you know that back and forth of it's almost like mana and magic, right? Where if you can only summon one monster per turn and your cards aren't good enough to let you do more than that, then that's kind of the same thing as mana in a, in a way, right? Um, but later 
you know, when the corns got better and it stops being that like forced back and forth interaction and it, it switches the emphasis to, you know, how do I make all my cards work together in, in this like way that does these consistent things and I'm going to have follow ups and defense, but I don't want to draw too much defense, you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, I think it, it switches to being much more like combo based and uh, like about what your deck can do as opposed to a technical play and like the back and forth grind. So I think like the early years of Yu-Gi-Oh were much more like technical play focused. And then like, you know, the more recent years have been more deck building focused. When do you, do you when do you think that switch happened? Do you, because like, you were kind of playing the whole time. Yeah. Um, so I think maybe there's like a middle period too where like the cards were good, but not great. You know, and, and I, I feel like that's probably from like 2009 up through like wind ups, okay. I, I would say. Uh, maybe even a little bit before that. Actually, yeah, a little bit before that, probably with like the dad stuff. Uh, I think that was probably like a middle part, you know, where like the cards are good, but they're not great. Um, and then I think 2013 is probably when it probably started to switch fully with dragon rulers like i think those cards were just a step above every other card that had ever been released in yeah, the game yeah and then really into like 2014 and after as well gotcha. yeah okay. i don't think it's ever switched since then like the cards now are all crazy <laughs> oh yeah now the power creep is insane that's funny because that's like those exactly when you described is when i stopped enjoying the game as much like <laughs> it became a thing and i was like oh there's like you just do your own thing and like yeah that's when i really stopped liking the game like i hated windups you know what's funny is uh windups were in a were a deck that got away from me too so before i ever won anything mm -hmm. you remember the papal imperative combo where you yeah 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 that was i crazy. created that and i posted it on duelist grounds i remember that yeah and i think Dale <laughs> even talked about that i i and then so i went to toronto which is the vice yes for this and i went eight and two and i got 33rd and my two oh, losses were to my own Papal Imperative yeah. combo. Oh, and then one of, and then Josh Graham won the event with it as well. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> that was when I really learned that you got to <laughs> be careful <laughs> about doing things like that. Yeah, for sure. That's funny. Dale, Dale talked about that because he was like, I think he mentioned you and was like, yeah, you posted like your list and like the, the broken combo and then switch that. And, um, but that was just like a, a changing moment too, where he kind of said um, there were so many like, online resources and like yeah. people really started communicating so uh, ideas spread a lot quicker uh, yeah and because of that i think the average player got a lot better mm -hmm. than the average player you know 10 years ago 15 years ago like i think the average player today is probably a lot better than them yeah for sure because before like you you show up to an event and you'd be like oh like what what are the top players playing like what's the right. go to meta game <laughs> yeah exactly and then now it's just like oh everyone's playing like everyone knows what's out there it's just like right. what the top players are deciding to play it's not like some secret thing well see i always tried to keep mine a secret though i was very like after a certain point because the the wind-up thing wasn't the first time the wind-up thing was totally my fault there was another time with like hieratics too where i did it there <laughs> um and where i went i went like 8-0 at this regional the the week before and then i ended up just not topping the event losing straight to my own deck after 8 0 in the regional and it came uh, that's, uh, <laughs> and then from that point on that was like my second lesson and i was like all right i really gotta start being a little more secret about this if we yeah, want <laughs> sure. well maybe you're the exception because you were the one building all these new decks still so uh, <laughs> nobody else on the internet knew them <laughs> So it, it, is that what you think kind of made you so successful is that you were kind of on the forefront of um, understanding that the game had now switched to combos and becoming less interactive and more about like deck building? Yeah, sure. I don't think I even probably intuitively understood it at the time, right? But I just, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that I started focusing on deck building like a lot earlier as, as like a real advantage, everything from like the Dragoonity deck Mm -hmm. um you know i feel like that that was all, definitely the real advantage to be had at a certain point because it was le a lot less like i cared about what my opponent was playing when i sat down if i just knew my deck was going to consistently do these same things that is very yeah. good at doing um so yeah I'd, I'd agree with that okay cool um what do you what format do you think you had the most success in um probably it had to be 2014 i five wins of the eight in, in that one year it had to be that it's somewhere in that year um but 
even that being said, they were all kind of like things changed. It was like set releases and like uh, you know, just ban lists. I think set releases started changing the game more than ban lists at a certain point too. Um just because like, you know, with the with the power creep, like every single pack that comes out is like slightly better than the last pack, essentially. You know, there are exceptions, but in general, I think that's the case. And you know, when when um yeah, and, and so like restricting certain cards that are too good definitely is one way to change the game. But I think even in the more recent years, it's always been the set releases that like really define the game. You get those like every three months. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Windows and ban lists, it's like the game's always changing, you know? <laughs> yeah, sure. Somewhere in 2014, for sure. Wait, what? It was all like different decks that you were dominating with? Uh, yeah, I, I won... I guess Burning Abyss probably. So like there was like a Burning Abyss doll format near the end of that year. Uh, and I had, I had like three wins in that format. So that one probably, yeah. Was there anything specific that you feel like made you so much better than everybody else at that one format or? Um, so I think I created like a different deck twice in that format. And so a funny story here is I actually tried to um like intentionally play a deck that wasn't as good <laughs> to try and make it to top cut know that people would copy me at this point and then I could play the other thing that I had created right yeah, and so yeah. I did this a couple times actually and it, it worked a handful of times both times I, like the Sylvan deck that I talked about earlier um I did it with a Lightsworn deck like right before that and then Lightsworn was like everywhere at that Nationals, then the Sylvan deck crushed the Lightsworn deck. Um, and then I tried to do it again though, uh, with Burning Abyss, right? Cause that format was very much like a rock, paper, scissors kind of format where, you know, Burning Abyss had a good matchup against Cliffort and Cliffort had a good matchup against Shadal and Shadal had a good matchup against Burning Abyss. Um, and so I was trying to do it with uh, the Burning Abyss deck with the Alex and Cal Cabs and Rubik's, just a lot of like Burning Abyss monsters. Um, and so I started playing it. I, I made it to Top Cut and I ended up winning the event, right? And I was like, okay, well, I guess people will definitely copy me now. And so like I, I started going home and like retesting the, the Shadal deck that I had made against this Burning Abyss deck. And I just couldn't beat my own deck at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and so I ended up playing just a second Burning Abyss deck like a week later at the YCS. Um, and I ended up winning the YCS again <laughs> right oh, after awesome. that, like the week after that. Um, and I just really just put a lot of side deck cards from, for the deck I stopped with the, or won with the week before, where it was like, you know, triple, uh, I think triple puppet plant, triple enemy controller, like double Ojama trio. And okay. I didn't have a single one of those cards in my side deck the week before. So then they just all, because it wasn't a matchup that existed, right? Like yeah, I, sure. I was just playing a deck uh, and then everyone copied that deck. And I guess they copied large parts of my side deck too. <laughs> um, but then, yeah, I just cited like 10 cards against the deck that I won with the week That's before. That's crazy. You could I, always be a step ahead because you're basically <laughs> the one deciding the format. <laughs> wow that's awesome that was after that was after the actual should all win too though uh with the three super polys but those were like draft too so like that was a that was an interesting time too um where you would play swiss with draft and then top cut or swiss with your deck and then top cut with draft mm -hmm. um i did like that interaction but it definitely gave an advantage to like the good players <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so how many hours do you think you were like putting into the game a week when you were at your peak? I don't know. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. <laughs> That's the thing. It sucks because like when you're, when you're so good at something and putting so much time into something, I feel like Konami should be rewarding you by giving you the chance to like, you know, go on like a, what do they call it? Like the pro tour or something magic, like where these people can make a living off of it and, you know, like it can become your job sort of, especially because you're you're doing such a big thing for the game by um, contributing so much. And it's like, you don't even get a big reward for that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I kind of feel t two ways. One, you're right. <laughs> like it would have been great if that was an option. Yeah. Um, but also on the other hand, like I wonder if it would have made me approach the game differently, right? Like if I was going at it about money like i don't know that i would have been as motivated as if like 
Whereas when, when the prizes are terrible, your only motivation is that you actually want to win. <laughs> That's so funny. So you, do, how do you feel about like prize support? Do you think they need to um, make it better or you think people should just be playing for the, for the fun and for, for winning for themselves? Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. Every other game has better prize support. So I, I kind of feel like they should make it better off of that. Though, like, I still do appreciate having just been playing because I wanted to win as yeah. opposed to, like, driven by something external. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, no, they should probably make it better. <laughs> <laughs> so that is that kind of what disappeared and made you decide to leave the game? Was that your drive just kind of went away to win? Uh, no, I just wanted to focus on Parvenu, really. Is, mm -hmm. and, and I love Yu-Gi-Oh, honestly. Like I, really? like I said, I would come back to it. And I love everything about it. I just wanted to focus on Parvenu. Gotcha. All right, so talk, talk, tell me about uh, Parvenu. Where, where are you at now? You said you just launched your like the second product with the data. Yeah, like six, seven months ago we launched it. Uh, and so like that was largely a response to coronavirus <laughs> because <laughs> it's crazy. But... Um, no, it's going really well. We've uh, been really focused on automation as like a, a way to grow. Um, so some of the some of the things we're doing are like really kind of creepy. You can do things like message different people and then like show them uh, landing pages with their face and their logo on it. And like when the next person clicks on it, they're going to see their face and their logo. And you can do like really, really cool things with that. But it, it really just makes it like, you know, when you're working with a small team, it makes it so that you can focus your time on the people that are, you know, actually interested instead of like, spending all day trying to get more and more people interested, you can kind of focus on the people that are mm -hmm. and building more automations. <laughs> it might seem like a, a weird, a weird stretch, but do you feel like there's anything, so like you're creating these decks that are like cutting edge and now it seems like you're creating a product that's like cutting edge that nobody else is really thinking of. Is there, is there something about maybe like your creativity or your uh, drive? Yeah, I, do you see a lot of similarities between like building a company and building a deck just because at the end of the day you're looking for good interactions right like at the end that's all you're really looking for is like man if i need to talk to you know all these relevant people and have them care what i say uh, and follow up with them like okay well i can talk to them over like email i can hit them up on social media i can call them i can text them but there's only like a handful of different things right mm -hmm. so then it starts to become around like okay now where do i get large amounts of these people that would actually be interested in how do I like send the most to them? How do I automate those follow-ups? And so like, I do kind of feel like it's similar just because you're looking for just interactions that are generally powerful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And that, and I feel like, I mean, I guess from my experience, it's like a lot of problem solving. So like your face, like, sure. yeah. Like your face with like an issue where that where like you could be like oh that's like sylvans or something and then it's like okay now i have yeah. to find the counter to it or like find the way to push past that absolutely um, yeah I, I completely agree yeah or maybe um, i'm just completely nerding out and just being no like, i agree oh, i totally <laughs> You know, A-B testing is a huge thing. Like at the end of the day, you don't know what's going to work, right? So you just go put multiple of them out there, show it to a couple thousand people, and then they'll tell you pretty quickly if they like it or not. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that's what playtesting was in Yu-Gi-Oh! So, you know, what's the difference, right? Love that. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what made you decide to um, start this company and what gave you the idea? Yeah. Uh, so I used to do uh, fundraising for the Nature Conservancy and Save the Children um, after after I moved up to D.C. Um, and then I think it really started there. I was just like looking for, you know, a way to, to do my own thing and, and help a lot of people. And um, I always felt like tech was like the you know, it's like the dragon ruler equivalent of, of business. I mean, it's super scalable. Like, I feel like you can have like a ton of impact, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas like, so I, I majored in political science and like uh, I worked on the campaign in 2016. So like, I thought I wanted to do, you know, things that are related to, to politics. And I worked on the campaign and it was, you know, a totally amazing experience. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, by the same token, I just feel like I could have a bigger impact by just, you know, figuring it out <laughs> essentially yeah. sure so what what can people do in like and what people can do in the or what can people do in the Yu-Gi-Oh community to like support you and to uh 
kind of get involved with what you're doing? Or is uh, they, they already did. Uh, really, I mean, I, I'm really appreciative of everybody who got involved. And in, we did an equity crowdfunding campaign about a year and a half ago uh, to to seed fund uh, Parvenu and to to build out the initial technology. And um, yeah, and no, I we wouldn't have been able to get to where we are today without that. So I'm I'm really appreciative of everybody in the Yu-Gi-Oh community. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. It's great when you create like that community of friends and uh, they're just kind of there to support you through whatever you decide to go through in the next couple steps too. Of like, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what? So, what are you focusing on with your company now? Like, what are the next steps of growth? And yeah, um, so really, my focus is is on automation. Like, and you know, maybe I'll never get to this, but the idea of a fully automated company is something that I feel like is is worthwhile working towards because even if you never get to it, you're probably gonna end up pretty far down the road. So like, you know, I try and do things like, think about how I should be spending my time and then how do I get rid of as many of those manual steps as possible. So try and go like, you know, if uh, let's say someone replies to an email, right? And I want them to show up in my sales database, then I want it to automatically talk to each other, right? Or uh, if someone replies to a message that I send on LinkedIn, I want them to come into my, you know, sales database as well. So really thinking about like all the things that I spend time on and just trying to automate all of them and get, get as many manual steps removed as possible. And then I can spend my time automating the next thing, uh, talking to the people that are interested. Yeah. Things like that. Really, really automation is like our key strategy at this point. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. It seems like kind of where the future's headed. So are yeah. you the one doing all the coding and everything or do you have? Uh, so no, work? so we have, uh, I, I'm not doing any of the actual coding for like the, the uh, product itself. Um, there are a handful of really, really cool tools out there that make it so that you don't have to code for like a lot of the automation that I'm talking about around like talking to people and like finding new customers and things like that. Um, so I, you hear and Shrey are the ones who like code all the, the stuff for the actual product itself, but I, I'm the one setting up the, the automations uh, around like, you know, when you're an early stage uh, company, uh, like when you run an early stage startup, it's basically your job to do sales, right? Like sales and tech are like the two things that really matter. And so like they, they, they do the code, I, I, I do the, the sales and then like I, I spend a lot of my time um, you know, on the sales side, as well as like setting up additional automations to mm. increase our sales, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, God, I can only imagine, like, do you just work nonstop? Because I feel like I work nonstop doing a Yu-Gi-Oh yeah. <laughs> card company. And like, you're, I feel like doing something way more advanced than that. So <laughs> like, do you, are you just going nonstop, basically? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I try to. I, I yeah. only, I'm down to like one all-nighter a week, so. <laughs> Jesus. That's crazy. Yeah, I think I'm at, I was at 70 hours or something this week starting today. Uh, I can only imagine what, what you're going through and where you're at. Um, that's awesome. So where, where can people find what kind of what you're doing and stay up to date with, with that kind of stuff? Just on your website? Yeah, sure. We have a, we have a website. It's parvenuenext.com. Um, you know, I'm, just, I'm on Facebook. At the up. <laughs> we also, you know, we have uh, like, we have Facebook, LinkedIn pages. We post updates there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, any of those. Sweet, yeah. I'll put a I'll put a link to your website in the um, description. We have a we have an email newsletter too. So like, if you sign up through the website, it'll just like keep you updated automatically as well. Sweet, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I'll have to sign up for that because I want to stay up to date with what you're doing. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so to to end with some like fun questions, you have any favorite uh, Yu-Gi-Oh moments that stand out for you? Favorite Yu-Gi-Oh moments? Ah, uh, probably too many of them. Yeah, um, well, when you win so many times, it's hard to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I um, definitely all the traveling. You know, I think that is like one of the things that really made not just me, but everybody like really, really enjoy the game. Yeah. Is you know, every three or four weeks, being able to go and consistently see your friends who just like live on the opposite side of the country or so, in some cases not even in the country but you still see them every couple weeks so, yeah. so um gosh. you know it, it I feel like it gives you the mindset that like the world is your playground <laughs> almost and uh, it's crazy yeah that's, that's I, I, so I really enjoy that yeah for sure um what do you have any favorite stories or like any um favorite events that stand out uh, Man, favorite events. So 
I feel like you know your first win is always the 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 biggest. I, I'll never forget when I'm playing. So I'm playing in the finals, and like I am playing against spell books. Both of my, I think it was maybe it was just one. I think I lost to one spell book, one evil swarm in Swiss, right? But I'm over here like, oh god, spell books. Like that's not the matchup I want. They could just lock you out. We got to play the finals for it. Um, but I will never forget when I overlay for big eye and I just set a card and everybody knew it was eradicator. And before the game was over, like as soon as I made the big eye, like everyone just went crazy. And it was just like, it really sucked. Like sunk in at that moment that I was going to win nationals. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Wait, what year did you win? 2013. 2013. Okay. Yeah. Um, Nats boy. 06. <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, I think you were there for my favorite event. I mean, there's so many fun events. Yeah, there's so many fun events. So many, but I think like one of the ones that stand out to me, and I think it might be my favorite, is um, Vegas. I, wow, I don't know if Vegas it's YCS. Yeah, I know, right? Every Vegas one, but like me, you, Paul Cooper, uh, Paul Clark, uh, Jonathan Weigel, our friend Freddie. Yep. And, uh, <laughs> We had obviously partaken in a, in a couple alcoholic beverages and we were just like roaming around Vegas. Yep. We ended up in like a food court. I feel like some like Weigel took- disappeared. You disappeared for like <laughs> an hour. I remember this. Oh, really? I don't remember. <laughs> it was so fun. And then I think like Weigel took your phone or something and like you, I feel like you or somebody got slammed into a door trying to get their phone back or like you chased him down the hallway trying to get your phone. It was so fun yeah <laughs> those are like the memories that just like made it all worth it and like you know that you kind of cherish forever absolutely yeah <laughs> yeah that was so fun i miss those days um you plan to uh play again like when <laughs> i don't <laughs> <We can>. know <laughs> i don't know how to play right now um i do want to get i do want to learn how to play at least just so i know um you know for the market and just like for for being able to like add value through like our youtube and everything um so maybe and like if i don't get booths at events because we're we're like i don't know if we're ots or we're at the like edge of being ots or we're waiting for like papers to come back or something right um but i would like to get booths at events but if i'm not like vending at at events then yeah i think i would want to play just to get that like experience and um you know have that fun and want excuses to travel and everything so yeah so I think that's the biggest thing is like when you don't have something like Yu-Gi-Oh to give you that reason to go somewhere every three or four weeks, you don't do it, right? It becomes much less frequent. And then, yes. yeah, I miss, I miss the reason to, to go somewhere, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Like I, I was talking to my friend George and he was like, they had just gotten back from like Ecuador or something. I'm like, okay. All right. <laughs> I, now that like everyone's going all over the world, like I need to get back in this because I haven't done anything. I was doing acting here and I was like, afraid to leave on any trip because i'm like i might miss an audition or something and it's like screw this like and i get back to living my life having fun right. having experiences you know in europe they have a crazy side of it where if you just it was uh just standings after swiss so it was like no playoff but whoever got first they played for your flight and hotel to the next european event and so i'm i'm over there right i was 5-0 in this event it was a six round event and we get deck checked and they were gone for so long. And you know, when they're gone, you're just like, oh, well, what's that? Something's going on. Come back, they disqualified my opponent out of the finals and then flew me back to Italy. <laughs> the next spicy. Really? And I was like, why don't we have this side of it in America? For real. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Even, yeah, even just for flights in the US, like that would be <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, no, I totally expected they they thought someone from Europe would win that event. Like, yeah, I'm sure. They're like, oh shit, this is more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any favorite cards of all time? Oh, Time Wizard. <laughs> I pulled it my first pack ever. Really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, did you keep it? I did. I did. I still have oh, it. Nice. <laughs> do you have all your cards still, or did you? Yeah, I probably have like three fourths of what I had when I was playing. I didn't really sell too much. Nice. Well, I bet you a lot of it's worth a lot of money now because it's <laughs> insane. Yeah, I've heard some of the cards have gone up like crazy. Yeah. So wait, were you were you super successful in Yu-Gi-Oh during high school or was it more like college? Uh, more college, yeah. More college. I think okay. I had like a couple of tops, like gotcha. in high school, but mostly college. 
were you i always ask this question were you like a closet duelist like did people know in high school and college that you were playing <laughs> or yeah no in general they knew um okay. and in college they they kind of had to know too because so i was like rushing uh a fraternity when i when i was playing Yu-Gi-Oh, and i just like would keep missing rush events so like i had to tell them something yeah <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, in general, I just told people. <laughs> How do you feel like Yugi fame affected you? Like, do you feel uh, like it affected you at all? Because it's weird when like people know who you are and like ask for autographs and pictures. Like, I feel, I mean, I was really young, so I think it like maybe had a little bit more of an influence on me, but, um, yeah, was that weird for you? Like, how how's it feel? And yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely weird, especially when you get asked for them at not Yu Gi Oh events. That's always the weirdest, I think. Wait, what? Um, what? What happened? Just like when you get asked for like an autograph or a photo or something, like not at a Yu Gi Oh event, and you're yeah. like, like that's happened to me since I've lived in DC. It's happened really? to me. Like, I think the weirdest place was like a mall in Mexico a full week before the event. <laughs> that was a weird one. Um, but I think more than anything uh it probably just made me an extrovert <laughs> because like i think yeah. before it i was very like introverted like i didn't you know i just didn't care to talk to people that much and then um like if you start doing well people will come and talk to you and you just have to get used to it kind of. oh yeah uh, so i think that it made me a lot more ex extroverted for sure nice that's great that sounds like a good positive benefit that yeah. came out of it <laughs> Did you feel like an increased confidence, uh, like outside of Yu-Gi-Oh too? Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, like when you're a kid and you're like, man, I really want to like do this and like, you know, I want to be amazing at this and then you do it Yeah. at, at the end, you're just like, all right, <laughs> I can do whatever I want now. Yeah. That's very true. That's very true. That's awesome. Yeah. I do feel like it was helpful for confidence. Cool. Well, um, I, I think I'm kind of out of questions. Is there any, uh, anything you want to add maybe about your company or tell people a little bit more about what you're doing or any shout outs you want to give? Yeah, I mean, I, I shout out to my entire team. Like, I, I'm really appreciative of, like, everyone we're working with. I, I'd love to come back to Yu-Gi-Oh! And I'm sure Woo! a lot of other people will feel the same way <laughs> right now. Uh, but hopefully, maybe we'll have, like, a Nationals later this year, depending on how the vaccines go and stuff. But <laughs> hopefully, yeah. <laughs> would, would people possibly see you at that Nationals if there was? Uh, yeah. Potentially. Uh, Potentially, I don't know. I honestly like I'm totally open to the idea of playing is just uh, like the level of time commitment. Because yeah. I think one of the things for me is like I, I would want to play enough to be really good. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to spend all my time on it. So it's like, a, it's a balance of how do you do both? Right? Yeah. Uh, I think when I find that balance, I will, I will play. <laughs> nice. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That's that's how I feel too. It's really hard for me to like half ass anything. So I'm yeah, like, yeah, like I I get too committed to something. I get like tunnel vision. Same. So, um, yeah, yeah, hard to find that balance. Well, hey, thank you so much for um, joining and um, talking, and it was great catching up with you. And great. Yeah, it was really you. good catching up with you. Yeah, um, I, I want to do DC trips because I have friends out in like Philly yeah, and everything. Please. So um. If I'm ever out there, I want to hit you up and, and grab dinner and hang out. Absolutely. You stay with me if you want. Come come through for sure. Just let me know. Sweet. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah, it was great talking with you. Great catching up. And for sure. uh, I wish you all the best with, with the company and everything. And I'm sure we'll, we'll talk soon. Yeah, thank you. And same to you with your company. Great. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> all right. Well, Pat, it was a pleasure. And um, I'm sure I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Cool. I'll talk to you soon, Austin. All right. Take care. Have a good one. Oh, and congrats uh, again on uh, the recent engagement. Thank you. I yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> Have you set a date? Have you set a date? No, mostly because of coronavirus, though. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, as soon as we're through that, we'll pick a date. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. All right, everybody go flood Pat with messages on his engagement. Uh, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> All right, well, have a good rest of the weekend. Yeah, you too. Good talking right. to you, Austin. You Bye. too. Take care.